Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind, which is, uh, I've been doing this for a while, and I get that at the individual, you know, for my data, my I see my up and down level, and I know that, hey, when it's higher, I'm generally going to perform better, and I can push a little harder when it's lower. I'm probably not going to perform as well, and maybe need to make that a little bit more of a, a, a less hard day. Um, but But then you get this question of, hey, like, what can I be doing to improve the quality of my health in a way that is measured by this output of HRV? Sure. I mean, this is where HRV is driven by like the genetics, fitness, primarily cardiovascular fitness is the biggest thing we see correlating drive it. And then obviously lifestyle. So doing things in your lifestyle that make that sympathetic dial come down when you don't need it and doing things that turn on that parasympathetic dial when you're not using this is going to put you in your highest level of your particular range, right? From a lifestyle perspective. And that's where I think most people underestimate the lifestyle impact on HRV and train everything else. They don't realize if you're stressed out from work, six, eight, 10 hours a day, you're running around chasing your kids, you're doing all these things in you know, your daily life, that has a pretty significant impact on your HRV because that sympathetic dial will be turned up for hours on end. Maybe not the same degree, of course, as a workout, but hours on end. So a lot of it comes down to just the stuff we know in everyday life that makes us healthier, right? Eating healthier foods, making sure we're getting enough sleep, managing our, our mental stress effectively, doing things that allow us to relax and turn that parasympathetic dial back up and that sympathetic dial back up, down, and then build VO2 max, you know, use strength training to... So do you think it's more impacted by peak aerobic fitness or by uh, base aerobic fitness. So is, would you say it's more impacted by a higher zone two or a higher VO2 max? I mean, they both contribute exactly how much, um, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't say because we don't, we measure, we tend to measure aerobic fitness from a peak standpoint for yep. the most part. Yeah. So that's, that's probably more standardized. We, more standardized what we would look at. But I think training frequency matters, which is where you get zone two, right? You can't do VO2 max training five, six days a week. We do a lot more zone two. We do a lot more frequency and volume of that. And I think that translates uh, more than likely into a higher VO2 or into a higher HRV, even if you didn't go out and do a bunch of the zone two or the, you know, VO2 max type work. Yeah. Um, and then tell me a little bit about sort of the, um, like what, as far as, okay. So one of the advantages I think of those overnight tests, uh, again, whether it's aura whoop, eight sleep, any of these things is, uh, uh, people have noticed how much of an impact alcohol has on overnight HRV. Sure. Um, it's probably one of the most profound changes you see in response to alcohol. And I would argue that a big part of the movement we're seeing around people drinking less can be attributed to those devices, which is giving people visibility into, oh my God, like, you know, I didn't realize that alcohol could have such a profound impact on this. Um, is that something I, I, I guess that would kind of be out of your system maybe the next day or would that still be there in the morning? It, it, well, it, it would depend in the sense of if you, if you had alcohol close enough to bedtime, yeah, it's going to impact your sleep, which impacts your recovery, which will impact the morning measurements. You'll still see some, some remnants of it for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you'll see that more directly in, in the overnight stuff. I think as a whole, what we see is people become much more aware of things like alcohol, things like excessive stimulants or, you know, God forbid smoking or, you know, just years of, or massive amounts of chronic mental stress. Those things impact much more than I think people yeah. realize. The example of this, we were measuring a college soccer team um, across a couple of seasons. And we would see that during finals week, they would look far worse than during tournaments, even competitive like uh, playoffs, just because that stress of being you know, in a finals week yeah. where you're studying and you're not sleeping and you're, you know, more stressed out. And what will give me a sense of the range that you would see? What, what, what would you see in an, like, give me an average athlete where this would be their morning HRV under these circumstances. This is what it looks like when they're overtrained. This is what it looks like when they're in the tournament. This is what it looks like in finals. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of variability there. Yeah. Um, but from a college standpoint, most soccer athletes that we would see in these are female athletes would be in the low mid eighties on a, you know, normal basis. And this, again, this is more system that's you can't compare these to other numbers yep. 
Um, but they'd be in the low to mid 80s, kind of as a normal range. We see them drop into the 50s, 60s, sometimes even seven, no, 70s, sometimes down to 50s, which is in Morpheus. That's, it's, that's it's the like, stress. Just, yeah, that was the stress of finals week. It's two, three, four days of not getting much sleep and, you know, studying a lot and just working out very less or very sporadically, probably compared to normal training sessions. You just see the impacts of life being very, very significant that people don't necessarily expect that because they feel like, oh, the workout's the most impactful thing. Well, it is in a way, but it's also only an hour, maybe two hours. It's the rest of your life that also adds up to a huge amount of stress if you are very, very stressed. And if you're going through your life, you know, in a, in that kind of type A, I'm always turned on, I can't turn off my stress. That has a very big impact. I think, um, you know, Sapolsky, who I know you've had on the yeah. show, talks a lot about the mechanisms. Like you see that play out pretty um, frequently when you look at HIV data. I don't utilize the Morpheus system fully because I only wear it during my zone two workouts. So I don't wear it when I'm doing my VO two max workouts because I'm already wearing that polar system because it pairs with the Garmin and it pairs with the other power meters and all the other stuff I'm using. Um, I guess I could double up. I, can you wear two chest straps? I mean, you could, so you probably could, the polar should be able to connect to the Morpheus app directly while you're training. And you but then just, it would have to pair to two apps. It should be able to, if it's got two Bluetooth radios, which it probably does. Okay. You, you so probably could do I could both. do that. That would be good to know. Yeah. Um, but I don't wear it when I'm strength training. And um, so so I, I realize that I'm failing to give it all of the data because that's another, you know, I, I don't wear it when I'm rucking. I, there's a lot of time I'm active, but I'm not sure. wearing it. So how much am I missing out on in terms of the fidelity of what it might be telling me? And I want to, because I want to talk about the algorithm and how it's able to, because, you know, one of the things you and I spend so much time on is I can't make sense of how it's coming up with the numbers, even though they end up being right you know, most well, of the time. Yeah, like the more data you give it, obviously, the better it's going to be um, exactly how much you're losing. And, you know, it's it's hard to say, but we're we're measuring the output with that HRV change and with the numbers that you're putting into it. So we, yeah. we know the output of where you are. We can't always ascertain how you got there if we don't have all that data of the workout sort of uh, things. But as long as we have that consistent HRV measurement every morning in standardized conditions, you know, we're still able to get the vast majority of what we're trying to get, which is what are you most likely to do when you work out right now? How so much that is, that is the most you? important thing. That's by far the most important so to, thing. To make sure that every day you see my heart rate, my heart rate variability, how long I slept, how sore I yes, am, and my that's, that's desire the, to train. Yeah, that's the vast majority of it. Because again, it's telling us where you are right now. The readout state. The readout, right? Now, it, that's the output. We know the output. This is where your body is, is at right now. If we can reverse engineer that from the input, we can have some more insight into that. But you're not like losing a bunch of accuracy because yeah. you didn't get that. We, we want the output. And we want that as standardized and accurate as possible. So I would say as long as you're measuring consistently every morning, the same context, same conditions, it's going to be more than accurate enough for what you want to do. 